Good morning and good afternoon to all of you. So I'm Ms. Dina Virapen, Staff Administrator from the IMF ATI. So we can see here we have a lot of participants who are joining now. From my side, I can see we have approximately 138 and others keep on uh, joining. So it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the annual meetings 2020 on the IMF Capacity Development Talk on promoting effective use of COVID-19 finance in Sub-Saharan Africa. So part of this topic reminds me of an IMF policy paper where the former UN Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, once said, I quote, good governance is perhaps the single most important factor in eradicating poverty and promoting development. So it is an interesting talk and a very big event for us, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic time. So I would like to extend a special warm welcome to our distinguished guest, to the Deputy Managing Director of IMF, the ministers, the CSO members, the IMF delegates, the RTCs, res reps, all participants present today to this annual meeting. So without any further delay, let me share with you my admin brief presentation for you to have a better idea of uh, the Zoom platform, uh, the rules of interpretation. So it is very important that for the uh, interpretation rules, you have to click on the icon interpretation. Once you click on the icon interpretation, you have the free language, English, French, and Portuguese. So you have to se select your favorite language. Once you select it and you'll be able uh, to uh, uh, view uh, to, to be able to talk uh, properly uh, on your favorite uh, channel. So also we have uh, the panelists. It's very important for you uh, to be uh, to be able to talk in a, such a slow way uh, so that all the uh, interpreters can be able to hear you properly. And I thank you for your attention. Now I leave the floor uh, to Mr. Rogeno, Deputy Director of the IMF ICD Division to proceed with the program. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Dina and viewers and listeners around the world. Welcome to this very first event of our capacity development series during these annual meetings. Capacity development is one of the IMF's three major activities. And while the IMF is often best known for its financing role, fully one third of our budget is dedicated to capacity development. This includes the provision of technical assistance and training to member countries in areas of IMF expertise, ranging from tax policy, revenue administration, financial stability and supervision, debt management, to the compilation and dissemination of economic statistics. In an important part, we do so through our 16 regional capacity development centers, including our Africa Training Institute, which is our gracious host today. Over half of the IMF's capacity development services are financed by our partners, and my thanks goes to them for their unwavering support. Increasingly, the IMF's capacity development activities are addressing new challenges, facing our membership, including gender, economic inequality, and climate change. Today's event falls in that category, focused as it is on the challenges of governance and corruption. It is therefore my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Ms. Antoinette Saye. She is the Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, uh, previously, she has also been the director of the IMF's Africa Department. Uh, she's been Minister of Finance uh, in Liberia, and she was a long-time staff member of the World Bank. Very much looking forward to your address, Antoinette. The floor is yours. Well, good morning, uh, Roger. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and good morning to everyone. Uh, a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, to warmly welcome everyone to uh, uh, this uh, session on promoting effective use of COVID-19 finance in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think we say so endlessly, but uh, COVID-19 has indeed disrupted our lives and livelihoods at a pace and scale we have not seen in living memory. 
And while the global economy is starting to come back from the depths of the crisis, uh, this calamity is really far from over. And all countries are now facing an ascent that will be long, uneven, and uncertain, and uh, certainly prone to, to setbacks. As you know, the, the IMF moved with uh, unprecedented speed and magnitude of assistance uh, to, to support countries. Since the beginning of the crisis early this year, we have disbursed 31 billion US dollars to 76 countries, and 33 of those countries are in Sub Saharan Africa. We've also provided debt relief uh, to 29 of our poorest member countries. 22 of those countries uh, are in Sub Saharan Africa. And we are balancing the need for emergency financing against appropriate governance, accountability, and transparency to ensure that help reaches those. Uh, in need. And our message to all governments has been spend whatever you need to, but keep the receipts. And countries that have benefited from IMF financing have committed to implement governance and anti-corruption measures. This includes uh, such uh, uh, measures as the online, online publication of crisis-related procurement contracts, the names of the winning companies and their beneficial owners, and ex post uh, validation, validation of delivery, along with audits of crisis related spending. The IMF has also been integrating more closely capacity development with financial support, including through our 16 uh, regional capacity development centers. In fact, over 90% of countries that requested emergency financing in recent months have received capacity development support through uh, hands-on technical assistance, practical tools, and policy training. And these have covered many of the areas brought to the fore by the crisis, such as cash management, domestic resource mobilization, debt transparency, and debt management. But a significant part of our capacity development support has also been focused on governance vulnerabilities in public financial management, anti-money laundering, anti-corruption measures. For example, uh, we helped Equatorial Guinea adopt anti-corruption legislation and Sierra Leone introduced good practices in setting up a fund earmarked for crisis relief. Uh, we also prepared technical notes on how to reduce corruption risk, all of which are publicly available on imf.org. So I've spoken of what the IMF has done, but we all have a role to play in ensuring the effective use of emergency financing. Governments are, of course, at the front line of fighting corruption. The IMF stands ready to share its tools and experiences, uh, but the political will uh, to make decisive progress in this area is with governments themselves. Civil society organizations can help governments by closely monitoring spending. Then international financial partners can help uh, strengthen their support to capacity development in this area. And on that note, I uh, very much want to thank our partners who finance more than half of the IMF's capacity development uh, work. I'm very much looking forward to ideas from this discussion around what more the IMF can do to ensure uh, adequate governance safeguards uh, of our emergency and other financing. Very grateful to the Africa Training Institute, uh, one of our 16 capacity development centers, uh, for helping uh, to organize this in event. With that, let me thank you for your attention and that, uh, turn back over to Roger. Thank you very much, uh, Antoinette. Um, I, I think you, you, you've set a, a wonderful tone for this discussion that we're going to have over the coming hour. We have a, an exciting lineup of speakers and I will introduce them one by one as we get to them. Um, before we turn to our panelists who are with us uh, live today, um, I'm going to show you a, a contribution we received from one of our principal supporters, namely from the European Union, uh, Jutta Orpilainen, Commissioner for International Development at the European Commission, uh, could not be with us in person, but has sent us uh, a short video. So please, with no further ado, let's roll the video. Dear colleagues, 
Since the start of the pandemic, I have said that strength will come from multilateralism, international partnerships and cooperation. The Team Europe response has done exactly this. It has raised billions to support the international response to COVID-19. And it has prioritized the most vulnerable partner countries around the world. What we need now is a global recovery initiative linking investment and debt relief to the implementation of the SDGs. EU will be counting on our important partnership with the IMF, especially our work together in Sub-Saharan Africa. Let me briefly outline three important elements of our cooperation. Firstly, a crucial area for cooperation between the EU and IMF is capacity building. With this crisis, this is all the more important. We need to strengthen country systems. We are proud to be among the most prominent contributors to the IMF's capacity building work. One excellent example is the support we give to capacity building centers like the AFRITAC centers in Africa. Over the past years, we have seen a significant improvement in how these centers and our EU delegations coordinate and communicate. Secondly, budget support. To date, Team Europe has raised around 1.3 billion euros through budget support for Sub-Saharan Africa. It is a quick, flexible way of empowering our partner countries face the crisis. In the long term, budget support is also helping our partners reach the SDGs through policy, dialogue and financial assistance. Let me emphasize the importance of the IMF in this regard. Our shared analysis and coordinated dialogue with partner countries is critical. We work on macroeconomic stability, public finance management, domestic revenue mobilization and budget transparency. Finally, we are natural allies in emphasizing the accountability of spending. Let me echo Kristalina Girgeva's words regarding spending. Keep the receipts. We don't want accountability and transparency to take a backseat in this crisis. Accountability and transparency will remain at the forefront of our efforts to fight corruption. We will also support democratic governance, strong enforcement mechanisms, participation and access to information. This is crucial for efficient management of public finances and achieving the sustainable development goals. Dear friends, despite all the difficulties in the past few months, the strength of our partnerships gives me hope. Partnerships between people, between countries and between institutions like our two institutions. So let's continue to do all that we can together to fight the virus and build back a better, more equal and sustainable world. Well, my thanks goes uh, to uh, Ms. Orpilainen and the European uh, Commission for their stalwart support uh, for capacity development. Um, and you have, will have detected uh, a, a common thread there, a common thread being uh, spend but keep the receipts. And that's really also our Twitter handle for this particular event. So do not hesitate to contribute. So with this, we're going to go to um, our, our first live panelist. And I'm extremely happy to have with us uh, Vitor Gaspar. Vitor Gaspar is the director of the IMF's Fiscal Affairs Department. He comes with an enormous amount of experience, including at the European Central Bank and, of course, as Minister of Finance and Economy in Portugal during the crisis. Vitor, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Roger. 
as you probably can see, I don't have your magnificent background because I simply forgot about it. My most humble apologies. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to wish you uh, this welcome to the um, to the uh, uh, to these meetings. And I'm now going to try to share my uh, presentation, and that should work. Can you see it now? I yes, guess very can. well. So the um, history of the IMF's uh, involvement with good governance comes back a long time. The uh, governance uh, issues have been emphasized by the Fiscal Affairs Department since the 1960s, but the quote here is from former Managing Director uh, Michel Candesou, and he uh, links uh, good governance to uh, favorable impacts on economic activity and uh, welfare. In more recently, in April 2018, the board endorsed a new framework for enhanced engagement on governance and corruption. And the framework allows a more systematic engagement with member states in issues of uh, good governance and how to tackle uh, vulnerabilities to corruption. Now, the framework that uh, the framework is uh, comprehensive and it does cover or is relevant for the three activities of the fund that Roger uh, listed at the beginning that is uh, uh, lending, uh, surveillance, and capacity development. Now, since the framework has been put into place, we have uh, been engaging with countries in areas of uh, fiscal governance, central banking governance, uh, financial uh, stability and financial uh, development, and last but not least, anti-money laundering and the rule of law. Now, this even before COVID-19 uh, showed the priority uh, to good governance and the fight against corruption. But as many have already uh, emphasized, COVID-19 makes this uh, priority to governance uh, even uh, more pressing. It's crucial to keep the receipts. Now, to uh, support uh, surveillance and programs, capacity development for country authorities is being stepped up. We uh, help countries in all of these areas. And coming myself from the Fiscal Affairs Department, that's what I want to zoom in on now with some examples. For example, we have been uh, engaging with uh, countries through technical assistance provided via remote uh, means. And as a reference, just a couple of highlights uh, for Togo, the mission help identify short-term measures to prevent revenue from further collapsing under the pressure of COVID-19. But at the same time, it has also supported the Togolese Revenue Agency to break out basic constraints and achieve significant and sustainable improvements for the medium term. In South Sudan, the remote mission supported development of uh, South Sudan new PFM, Public Financial Management Reform Strategy, and assisted the development of a single treasury account. Up 
apologies. I have a slight technical challenge now. Moving on. One very important activity that we have been carrying out is uh, governance diagnostic uh, missions. And the idea is to have a in-depth look at governance uh, in uh, member countries that so wish. And we have already undertaken 10 of uh, these missions in the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Con Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, Rep Republic of Congo, and Zimbabwe. In the case of the uh, Central African Republic that you see in this slide, you see the cover of the report in the slide, the diagnostic mission took place late uh, 2019, before COVID, covering revenue administration, uh, public financial management system, the rule of law, and the anti-corruption framework. The report was finalized, and the authorities of the Central African Republic have published it on the government's website. Based on the diagnostic recommendations, they drafted a law to strengthen their asset declaration regime, to bring it in line with best practices and are in the process of elaborating an action plan to implement the uh, recommendations of the report within the next two years. So let me now uh, conclude. Following the implementation of the 2018 framework for enhanced engagement on governance and corruption, we have been stepping up our efforts to build a world with better governance and less corruption. To help achieve that goal, CDA system is being enhanced to help member countries in areas such as fiscal governance, central bank governance, and anti-Monday laundering measures. Strengthening governance and mitigating uh, corruption cannot be addressed by the IMF alone. On the contrary, it uh, requires a deep engagement and political will on the part of the members uh, concerned. And therefore, it's an area where the leadership is uh, 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 firmly in the hands of our member countries, as is always the case in our capacity development activities. And I stop here. Back to you, Roger. Thank you very much, uh, Vitor. Thank you very much for this extremely informative overview of all the capacity development work we are, we are doing in the area of, of governance and corruption, which uh, your department plays an important role, as does, for example, the legal department, but also our monetary and capital markets department. It's really something that has been become very much part um, of uh, the IMF's capacity development across, across the board. So I think that was extremely useful. Um, and thank you also for sticking to our 10-minute to our time limit. That's been very helpful. We have a number of speakers to go. Thank you. Um, no, it's a great pleasure and an honor to show our, our next uh, panelist, Mr. Regis Imongo, who is a member of uh, the Parliament of Gabon, member of the Finance and Budget Commission. He was a minister several times, including a minister of finance, a minister of... Uh, uh, oil. I'm very happy to have him today, Mr. Bongo. You have the parole. Mr. Imongo, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. Very good. All right, it's good. Thank you. So I was uh, saying small precision. 
I was not uh, Minister of Oil, I was Minister of the Energy, and I wanted, uh, wanted to say hello to Roger, hello Antoinette, hello Victor. It's very happy to see you again. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, the IMF for its reaction. I will say that COVID-19 is uh, the manifestation of the black swan theory. It's an event that you never think of, but it happens with enormous damage that we must uh, kind of uh, limit so that we don't have a multiplier effect on our economy and social welfare. It is true, our countries were just coming out of uh, a difficult situation since uh, the terms of exchange decreased in 2014 and Africa was breathing again. Unfortunately, the pandemic came back and we have to take measures that will avoid the collapse of our system. Uh, these measures were translated by actions taken by the IMF, the World Bank, the African Bank. Uh, our countries took advantage of uh, the uh, new instrument of the IMF was uh, a quick sum that allowed us to take appropriated measures to avoid the worst of the pandemic, but especially to strengthen the structures that will help you to fight against the pandemic and to try to limit the effects for our economy. These measures have allowed us to mitigate uh, the effect uh, in order to have a strong tool to fight against the pandemic. For instance, we could see that uh, we have managed the pandemic well. Measures were taken. We created uh, piloting committees uh, that are managing day to day the health side. But besides, of course, there's the financial side of things. Gabon uh, took advantage of the IMF financing and other partners. Uh, Gabon also made efforts in order to have its own resources uh, to be affected against the pandemic. The Gabonese parliament could not be absent, of course. And on June 29th, we had a plenary session in the parliament where on the basis of a proposal, we accepted the creation of a parliamentary uh, inquiry committee that is going to follow how these funds were followed and whether these funds reached the objectives that they were aiming for. So this is a good notion of good governance. Good governance is essential uh, for our uh, level of economic and social life. Good governance is a general notion that should be applied everywhere. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we have to take uh, into account what is happening to us, but good governance is essential for us. And all the uh, speeches from the president to the government follow this principle. So the inquiry commission has been created. Several parliamentarians have uh, started their inquiry. They audited uh, ministers, administrations, to see in reality how uh, these funds were utilized. This allowed us to see if we have reached the uh, goals, to see the failures, of course, that always happen given the speed of the spending of these funds. Of course, the pandemic accelerates, uh, the funds arrive uh, accelerated, the spending is accelerated. So the speed uh, probably uh, created a few problems. And that's where we can do adjustment. This work is done in collaboration with the uh, parliamentarians that represent the majority party and the opposition party. And it's done in full transparency. And of course, our colleagues have full trust in this uh, commission. We're going to have the report of the inquiry commission. We, it's going to be read in plenary and the government is going to see and check whether we reached our goals and what to correct for the future because uh, it's not going to stop here. We are going to keep on fighting against the pandemic. And of course, and above all, 
have measures that will give more dynamism uh, within the real sector. I don't want to be too long, but I can say that we need this. The IMF made a step. Uh, the IMF should make other steps. I listened to the uh, commissioner from the European Union who said that we should link, link uh, investment efforts and debt efforts uh, to this. Uh, this should be put on the agenda of the IMF. Uh, the debt uh, of uh, middle-income countries, because we have uh, received a brutal shock. We should receive more possibilities on the debt especially if we are more transparent, if we have an adequate management that has been demonstrated, maybe then we could turn to the debt. So for me, it would be desirable to uh, reward uh, the good pupils, the good students, those who have shown uh, trust that uh, we followed uh, the conditions that were uh, following the fund. I think it would be desirable, as I said, to be rewarded. And this could go also with a strong implication of parliaments in Africa, civil society for the control. This is where the IMF has another role to play with capacity building. Of course, uh, there are control uh, organizations in Africa, but we should uh, associate the parliament, the Gabonese parliament, for instance, to uh, uh, missions, but we need capacity strengthening for that. That's all I can say. And of course, I'll speak later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regis. Thank you for having uh, underlined the importance of transparency, uh, control instances. Uh, of course, the parliaments are very important for that. Now. I'm very happy to uh, to welcome Ms. Beauty Emefa Narte. She's the Executive Secretary of the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition. Um, it is extremely valuable uh, to have with us uh, a voice uh, from civil society, as, as Regis Simongo just said. Civil society plays an important role in the uh, oversight of government finances, and during this COVID pandemic, that role is all the more crucial. Um, so please, with no further ado, uh, Beauty, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to say good morning and good afternoon to colleagues from all over the continent. And also to thank you for this opportunity. On Tuesday, 14th July, 2020, the IMF held a virtual dialogue with African CSOs in a webinar titled Promoting Effective Use of COVID-19 Finances in Africa, an IMF discussion with African CSOs. And I believe a number of colleagues who participated in the meeting are in this meeting as well. The meeting actually provided opportunity for us, CSOs, to have the IMF listened to our suggestions about safeguards that should be attached to COVID-19 funding in key areas of transparency and accountability. And participants highly commended the IMF for the emergency COVID-19 funding. Admittedly, as earlier speakers have already mentioned, the funds helped governments who needed quick funds to procure life-saving health equipment and also to help provide social protection safety nets for the most vulnerable, among other things. Whilst we acknowledge that these efforts are praiseworthy and by the IMF, some concerns were also raised regarding the absence of conditionalities which pose significant challenges for transparency and accountability. We note that the fiscal policy and financial decisions that could be made with a sense of immediacy and haste, particularly the immediacy of cash injections and receipts 
creates opportunities for corruption. We were of the view that crisis moments provide opportunity for corrupt government officials and private individuals with authority over the distribution of funds and contracts to enrich themselves at the expense of the poor and needy. A case in point is the $5 million of aid money lost to fraud and corruption during the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. And money was lost through overpriced supplies, payment of salaries to non-existent aid workers and fake customs bill. And unfortunately, we have already started hearing some allegations of corruption even regarding the COVID emergency fund. So these lessons have even indicated the need for effective measures and a whole society approach in the management of public funds during crisis. Because civil society has also recognized our important role that we must play to minimize integrity violations and rebuild trust in the process. For civil society, we believe that to stimulate trust building, it is necessary to consider independent oversight from, from us. We are well positioned to provide independent monitoring and tracking of government spending to prevent disadvantages and inequalities in public expenditure. For instance, CSOs can leverage on our reach and expertise to independently verify and monitor government commitments and provide government and IMF with the relevant evidence-based data that reflects citizens' voices, citizens' reality, and citizens' needs. Regrettably, we also observe that economic and financial conversations typically occur in closed or invitation-only spaces while civil society is usually excluded. Access to relevant information continues to be a challenge in most countries. Even though the IMF has asked member countries requested emergency assistance to commit to enhanced reporting of crisis-related spending, we have noted that these are not the case. Few government practice publishing independent post audits of crisis related spending. Few governments are publishing procurement contracts. Few governments are publishing the beneficial ownership information of first awarded procurement contracts. And in, in some cases, even where civil society needs the information, we have to resort to the courts to access public information. How can we provide independent oversight without the requisite information? Additionally, civil society also has technical capacity when it comes to areas of economic and fiscal governance. And by practice, we only have few national civil societies who are engaging in the economic and fiscal governance practice. Uh, platform to the disadvantage of the local level CSOs. Some CSOs, including the media, are also operating in constrained civic spaces. And this also affects the ability to work. And we also observe when it comes to the COVID, some governments have taken on due advantage of the COVID protocols to even churn out stricter protocols that prevent civil society's independence to effectively operate. The question therefore is how effective can we be given these challenges? But we are also of the view that the IMF is well positioned to address some of the challenges and increase our efficiency and capability to undertake our expected role. For instance, the IMF 
could hold prior consultation with CSOs before the investments of funds. This will provide the IMF opportunity to validate information provided by government with CSOs, as well as adequately prepare CSOs to keep an eye on the commitments made by various governments. By doing so, the IMF will foster a very strong partnership with CSOs from the onset to secure full commitment and ownership. Additionally, the IMF could consider a, the adoption of enhanced bottom-up information sharing, communication, and engagement with CSOs. And the IMF has the potential to also build our capacity regarding the identified gaps we have. We could be empowered in areas of public financial management, fiscal governance, financial sector monitoring, among others. And this could be done either virtually or in country to support CSOs with the requisite capacity to be able to provide that independent oversight. The IMF could also consider a possible review and standardization of the anti-corruption commitments made by our various governments to aid effective monitoring. Because we note that some of the country level commitments may be difficult to measure. Others are too vague. So you are not able to even identify them, let alone monitor them. And I regret to say this includes the commitment of my own country, Ghana. Another issue that we thought, given the current COVID challenges, is the IMS taking lead in terms of pushing for proactive disclosures, information disclosures, especially digitization of information given the COVID circumstance. I use the example of the letters of intent that are published on the IMF website, as well as the websites of our government. Could the IMF also explore the possibility of publishing some of the relevant procurement and beneficiary ownership information as part of their commitment to anti-corruption? Perhaps this could also discourage our governments from withholding relevant information from the citizenry once they know that the IMF has some commitment to publish such information. We expect the IMF and encourage the IMF to engage in deeper discussion with CSOs at all levels. Engagement should not be limited to regional levels. There are some unique country level and local level challenges that will require distinct country level strategies to address. So it is important that the IMF's presence is felt at, in, in country at all levels. And this would also help in building alignment with citizenry and civil society and also disabuse the minds of people regarding some perceptions they may have about the IMF. Because the closer you work with somebody, the better you know them. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that CSOs, we have fully committed to continue acting as watchdogs in our respective countries. Nevertheless, we urge the IMF to consider striking a good balance between providing rapid financing to save lives and livelihoods, and also consider facilitating a more structured CSO-led approach for independent monitoring and tracking the use of the emergency funds. Thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Beauty, for, for that intervention. I think it underlines very nicely the importance um, of uh, civil society uh, in in our dialogue, uh, but also in our the IMF's work uh, on, on on the ground, and I hope we will have uh, the uh, opportunity now during the Q and A 
to get a little bit further uh, in, into that. Um, so we, we have about 20 minutes left, um, and I'd like to use uh, those uh, that time uh, wisely as much as we can. Um, we've received a number of questions uh, via, via the chat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to um, relay those uh, to some of the panelists uh, to be able to, to provide some, some answers. Um, let me start with uh, you, Vitor. I had a question here um, that asks, are there supportive measures taken by advanced economies, say the US or the uh, European Union, um, to help Sub-Saharan Africa cope with growing poverty and unemployment uh, in the wake of the pandemic? Um, and is there particularly financing uh, carved out uh, for health support? Um, but from your perspective in the Fiscal Affairs Department, um, what, what would you be able to say in response to, to, to that question, Vitor? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Roger. Uh, I hope that you will allow me, before I go to the question, to uh, make two remarks, uh, one on each of the presentations from the other panelists. So on uh, Ridges, uh, you said right at the beginning that uh, COVID-19 was like a black uh, swarm, so that one could uh, not have uh, foreseen this. You will allow me, Regis, to make the point that uh, in order to uh, promote the importance of uh, thinking about fiscal risks and risks in advance, I uh, remind everybody participating in this call that interestingly, in uh, 2005, the Congress Budget Office here in the United States uh, made a scenario for the impact on the US economy of a bird flu. And interestingly, the macroeconomic impacts that were estimated at the time are very close to what we estimate now to be the impact of COVID-19 in the US economy. But perhaps even more impressively, the sectoral composition of the adjustment in the economy is strongly uh, correlated. On uh, beauty, you may recall, uh, beauty, that in the engagement of the IMF with uh, civil society organizations in Sub-Saharan Africa, I uh, put on a painting from Lorenzetti where the theme was precisely the importance of the engagement of citizens in the control over government. And our research in particular in the April 2019 fiscal monitor uh, shows that indeed uh, transparency very, is very important, but it is the more important, the more uh, press is free, the more civil society organizations are engaged. And so this is uh, very, very important. Roger, on the question, we do see that around the world, most uh, fiscal action, most financial action has been taken by advanced economies, by large uh, emerging market economies. There has been uh, support that has indirectly benefited uh, emerging markets and low-income countries. The uh, financial conditions in the world have, uh, have uh, normalized, but still it is true, as uh, we always emphasize, that no country from Sub-Saharan Africa has been able to issue in euro bond uh, markets since uh, March. The last country from Sub-Saharan Africa to have done so was Ghana in uh, uh, February. We have in the spring meetings very much emphasized the need for support to low-income countries uh, in general, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in uh, particular, but one of the themes uh, that is uh, going to resonate from the annual meetings is that uh, we need uh, to do more. And Antoinette uh, has uh, spoken uh, uh, has spoken eloquently and uh, repeatedly on that uh, issue. May I stop here, Roger? Thank you very much. That was uh, very very helpful. Um, let, let, let me go to um, uh, Régis uh, Imongo. Uh, Régis, nous avons reçu une question qui... Uh, Régis, we have a question. And it's this. 
what can the IMF do to help protect the financial flows that benefit African countries? And I ask you this question, because if I ask that question uh, from the IMF, there will be many answers. But from your standpoint, how can the IMF be helpful to African countries when it comes to the management of the COVID financial flows? You have the floor, Regis. Thank you for the question, Roger. But maybe before answering, I think that we need to recognize the falling. Victor said something about this. In this situation, and in the spirit, the politicians, the counter-cyclic politicians and initiatives are good because for the countries that have a certain uh, margin, but the budget margin for countries are limited in anyway, but the IMF must think about that uh, when he thinks about future future scenarios or even the scenarios that will be uh, soon developed. So those countries could continue to have an economy that functions and to have revenues. Now, how can the IMF help to protect the funds, uh, the IMF funds and the other organizations funds? But first thing is that we must agree on the figures, uh, on the uh, targets. Well, the <clears throat> the disbursement is quick. The countries present their point of view. But now, uh, since the pandemics, pandemic continue, we have a better view about things. We have a better idea. We know what are the needs, that sanitary needs for certain countries. So I think we have to agree on the targets. What are the objectives that we want to reach and through what mechanisms? Once we agreed about that, together we'll launch a platform with different actors, the IMF and other organizations. IMF could also help other organizations to be stakeholders in this process at the beginning or at the end of the process. But it, all that to better evaluate the impact of the initiatives that we may take. I think this is an indispensable element of this. The IMF in, the, in its strategy for the post COVID or for the second round or quick financing for COVID must take that into account, and I think that's possible. Now, uh, concerning governments and, uh, well, the real sector is threatened by this. Uh, uh, our tertiary sector in Gabon is uh, impacted by this, residents and others. So for that, we need to find something to make up or compensate for that. And the IMF might you know, follow up on these funds that are <clears throat> disbursed by all these organizations. Thank you, Regis. Of our, of our talk, um, I understand that we have with us um, Mr. Darbo, from the, uh, who's the commissioner at the Gambia Revenue Authority, um, and uh, he would like to make a, a brief live intervention. Um, I think this is technically possible. So if I could ask uh, the technical team to give the floor uh, to Commissioner Darbo, then we can uh, listen to his brief uh, comment. Uh, Commissioner Darbo, the floor is yours. Oh. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, coordinator. And thank you very much for all the other speakers. And uh, I want to say good afternoon to you all. Over here, we are almost uh, around 2.30. Um, I want to take this opportunity 
to um, deliberate a little briefly the uh, relation between revenue collector and the use of the COVID-19 finance financing. In the Gambia, it's a small country in West Africa, about a population of 2 million people. Like all other countries, COVID-19 was an unexpected shock that negatively affect, affected all countries, including the Gambia. And the pandemic itself and the subsequent policy and administrative measures negatively impacted on revenue collection in the Gambia, leading to 19% drop in anticipated revenue receipts in 2020. However, the current trend indicates the COVID-19 impact might be less than 19% drop in the revenue and initially anticipated. This is because the intervention of government, development partners, civil society organizations have helped minimize the negative impact of COVID-19. For example, in the Gambia, the higher percentage of our revenue receipts, 56% come from international trade activities. The pandemic leads to closure of borders, airports, meaning re-export trade that accounts for between 20% to 40% of imported volumes initially destined to the Gambia, we are all stopped. However, the intervention of government, development partners, civil society organization, and philanthropists through the vision, provision of basic food, food items and hygienic materials help the businesses initially stop with their goods to sell them locally. This, this helps them to maintain their initial imp imported turnaround challenges and bring in more revenue for government. In addition, the injection of the COVID-19 finances help many local businesses to diversify in order to access this fund. For example, many tailoring shops went into max making. Many of the hotels benefited from being used as quarantine centers to compensate for the closure of the tourist seasons. In addition to that, government came up with an idea of uh, contacting and make the medium enterprises and vendors in the supply of basic food items to the population during this, its intervention. And this has helped to keep them in business. All these intervention contributed to revenue collection revenue collection through the withholding tax regime in businesses. This small please, and medium enterprise. I'm sorry, to, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could you please uh, wrap up in, in the next minute or so, because I want to uh, have the okay. opportunity uh, also to um, listen to Mr. Uh, Salas. Thank you so much, Mr. Let, let me, yeah, let me, yes, let me just wrap up. I, I am saying that um, when the pandemic starts, government came and development partners came to help the population and the businesses have a lot of stocks in with them and therefore the purchase of those food items from by the government and it helps them a lot to reduce the stocks that they have. At the same time, the revenue authority also benefited a lot by holding, by having what we call withholding taxes. And uh, that withholding tax is a lot of revenue for the government. And finally, because of the social distances, People we are most, most of the time people are staying at home and they make a lot of use of the telecoms, uh, telecoms businesses and which uh, has also uh, uh, helped the, the revenue authority to generate a lot of revenue through the VAT receipts. This is by because of the usage of the data and the telephone services in the Gambia. So subsequently, consequently, there are, the COVID has come, it has negative effects, but at the same time, through the intervention of our development partners, as well as the government and philanthropics, we are able to manage it so that even the in anticipated revenue loss we think, which is 19%, it finally it has come down, dropped to that. We are thinking of now about 10 or 9%. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Darbo. Um, it, it is now my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you 
uh, Mr. Abebe Aymro Selassie. He is the director of the IMF's uh, Africa department, um, and he has kindly offered to draw uh, some final conclusions from our fascinating debate today. Uh, Abe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roger. Uh, really has been a very, very uh, uh, interesting discussion to follow. Uh, and my task really is to uh, to pull on uh, the various themes that have been, uh, that I've, at least I'm taking away from this. I think the first um, takeaway from me is uh, about the effects of the pandemic. Yet another reminder of how uh, the, the pandemic really has affected public finances uh, with a vice-like uh, effect. Huh? I mean, uh, you have this pincer movement. Uh, on the one hand, revenues have collapsed uh, for government, but, you know, uh, in most countries. And then on the other, you have a big increase in spending towards health, towards uh, social safety nets, leading to larger deficits and debt, uh, which of course, some treatment has been needed for. As uh, Regis very nicely reminded us, there remain some countries who have not, of course, benefited from, from uh, the pressure on debt that they're facing. Second uh, takeaway really is that, you know, um, this agenda of uh, promoting good governance and tackling corruption is one that has multiple stakeholders. Governments, policymakers first and foremost, of course, but also parliaments, uh, really very important, uh, all manner of government accountability institutions, uh, auditor general's offices uh, and the like. And as important, uh, the public, the civil society organizations. So this is a multiple stakeholder game, not just, you know, something for the IMF, uh, um, although we do also, of course, have a crucial role to play by providing technical assistance in, in you know, um, best practices in strengthening uh, accountability institutions, in providing technical advice on how to how to bring transparency to public finance management and the like. So multiple stakeholders. Third issue, I think, that came to me, um, including from Beauty's intervention, is like, you know, how can institutions like the IMF strike the right balance between providing rapid resources and uh, making sure that these resources are not abused, as uh, Beauty very nicely laid out. Moments of crisis uh, are also opportunities for people to, to uh, abuse um, uh, weak financial systems. So how do we strike this balance? Um, that's something that we're going to have to think about. As you rightly noted, conditionality has been limited uh, in the context of these of these uh, uh, rapid financing that we've been providing. Uh, that's by design, of course, because really this is a moment of solidarity, a moment of dire, dire need in, in countries. So we needed to move quickly. Uh, uh, the expectation that we had, of course, though, is, was that the resources would be used, number one, transparently, and second, uh, it would be subject to audits. Um, and so this brings me to the last, uh, perhaps most important thing, the takeaway really is, you know, uh, the need for both transparency uh, and accountability. Um, the transparency side, I've always felt, is by far the most important contribution that the IMF makes to to countries' uh, economic policy design. You know, getting the information about how budgets are being allocated, how revenue is being collected, out into the public domain, out for public uh, scrutiny, I think is by far the most important thing we can do. Not least because you know we uh, rely on domestic accountability mechanisms to to take to task. Uh, wherever resources uh, are being uh, misappropriated or not being used in an opt in, in the most optimal way, um, and this uh, on this count, I mean, you know, I take on board the comments that were made about the need for the fund to promote the visibility of these uh, of these uh, documents that we're expecting governments to publish. Uh, of course, this has all been happening in the context of the last six months, so uh, it's early days yet to see how effective the, the expectations that we've uh, had of uh, publication of these documents uh, is and how much governments are living up to it, but it's something that we will intend to follow up on. With that, let me stop here. Uh, thank you so much for the fascinating discussion. It really has been very uh, wonderful. Um, back to you, Roger. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Abe. Um, with that, we have reached uh, the, the end of, uh, of this hour-long uh, debate. I'm not going to attempt to summarize it. I think uh, Abe did so perfectly. Um, let me take this opportunity simply to thank um, our esteemed panelists for their time and their contribution. Um, 
Let me also thank all of you uh, listening and watching uh, us uh, around the world. If there's one advantage um, of uh, these virtual annual meetings, it is that we can reach out to many of you who are not in Washington. And it's a great pleasure for me to see how many of you uh, in, in Africa uh, were able to join us today. And finally, let me say that this is the first um, of our series of talks on capacity development. Uh, the next one is uh, on Wednesday, uh, where we will be discussing debt, debt management, fiscal risks, uh, transparency, really a very hot topic of uh, these annual meetings. So I hope many of you will be able to join us again on Wednesday. With that, let me close the seminar and wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye.